the phone rang and I sat on the bed and she said, Daniel's dead. He was playing football and he'd just gone over to get a football and he collapsed. You'd wake up just with those first thoughts of the day were just, oh God. I did have a, a fear that I was going to repeat history. You've been through so many things and many of those things, I mean, so many of those things are in this book, the first half. One of the most uh, heart-wrenching stories you tell is when you were 19 years old and you get a phone call from your mother about your brother, Daniel. Can you still remember that day clearly? Oh, absolutely. And when I wrote that chapter, which turned out to be the first chapter in the book, because it was, I wrote it because I wanted to practice writing to get myself into the rhythm of writing the book, not knowing where that chapter would be. And when I wrote it, I realised it had to be the start of the book because it was the seminal day of my life, really, because there is a before and there's an after. And that day is that day that really defined so many things for me. Your mum calls you and says, from what I read in the book, she's very to the point about what's happened. She says, Daniel is dead. She called me and the phone rang and I sat on the bed and said hello in the kind of, you know, normal cheery way. And she said, Daniel's dead. And that was, you know, I can't express how shocking that is because you, he was fine, you know? So there was nothing wrong with Daniel. He wasn't ill. He'd never been ill. You know, he'd never had anything wrong with him. So it was so just mind blowing to hear, you know, I, I, my, in my mind, immediately created a narrative that he had been run over or he had been in a car accident. I decided quickly that he was in a car because he was 16 nearly. He was 15 going on 16. Maybe one of the older boys that he knew had just passed his test. Maybe he'd been taken and I had a, him driving down this road that I knew in Leeds and this is where it happened. And, and then very quickly, my mum started to tell me actually what had happened. That was not what had happened at all. He'd, he'd collapsed in the garden. He was playing football um, with my dad and my little brother. And, and my little brother was six, Jordan, and he'd just gone over to get a football and he collapsed and died. And that was it. That was like, that was as much as my mum knew at that point, because by this point she'd been to hospital and she had um, already kind of got home, which sounds really bizarre saying that in 2022, because now we would have been on the phone the minute he collapsed. You know, she would have rung me and said, but they didn't have mobile phones. And, or if they had a mobile phone, it was very, you know, basic. I don't even know if they had a car phone. And so the immediate thing was to get him to hospital and to get an ambulance. And so to not include everybody in that process. So I was in London, she was in Leeds, and then they were at the hospital and then they came home. And it was hours later that I found out, which again, seems strange, you know, that I, I didn't know that this was all happening. I wasn't being given a blow by blow account of, of what was happening. So I, all I had was at that point, her information, which was very scant that something had happened to his heart. His heart had just stopped. And the, the doctor who was at A&E or the, the emergency section of the hospital when they arrived happened to be the doctor who'd given birth to me, who'd helped my mum deliver me. And he was the old Leeds United doctor. And so he'd known the family for a very long time. It was a complete coincidence. He was doing a shift on a bank holiday and he just walked out of theatre an hour after my brother had gone in and, you know, shook his head. And and it's that kind of nightmare, nightmare scenario for any any family, any parent that, you know, they just didn't, they believed he was going into hospital because he got heat stroke or something. And they, you know, in their heads, they created what, it was a hot day. He must have been dehydrated. They did not expect that as the outcome. It sounded fanciful to me. I couldn't, I couldn't get my head around the idea that this very fit young man would just collapse. And I, I want, you know, I wanted to immediately wanted to know kind of more, but there was nothing, you know, and that's a really frustrating. And, and there was no internet to go and go, okay, what, how could, how can a young person die? You know, how does this happen? And we now know, of course, so much more about um, cardiac arrest in the young. And there's a, you know, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is what he was diagnosed with. And that means basically the heart just stops without warning. And we've seen very famous incidents in, in football. Um, Christian Eriksen, the Dem Danish footballer at the last Euros collapsed on the pitch and his life was saved because he was in the perfect place for that to happen. There was medical resource around, you know, people knew what they were doing. And Daniel was in the garden, you know, there was nothing there. So he was, he was never going to survive that. But if you you know, if he'd, he'd been somewhere 
where there was a, a defibrillator or he was in a hospital when it happened, you know, he may well have survived. But at the time, obviously, we just couldn't get our heads around it. I read in the book that the neighbour tried to resuscitate him. So we had a neighbour who was a, he'd worked on oil rigs offshore and he had paramedic qualifications. He wasn't actually a paramedic, but he'd done some qualifications. So my mum thought, oh, Morris next door, he'll know what to do. And my mum was, when she was telling me like later and then years later when we discussed it, she was, she said she was so relaxed about it because, because he wasn't, to her, he wasn't dead. He just collapsed and, you know, nobody could think of him as being an unfit person. So she wasn't relaxed in the sense she wasn't urgent, but she just thought Morris will sort this out. You know, Morris came around and he couldn't get him back. He couldn't get his heart going. And, but they still didn't use the word. I don't think they said his heart stopped because nobody wants to say that to a parent. So Morris obviously put him in the, in the ambulance, I think knowing that his heart stopped, but my parents didn't know his heart stopped. They thought he was collapsed or he was in some kind of like, you know, heat induced coma or something had happened to him that, that meant he just wasn't responsive. I think that was the thing. They thought he wasn't responsive as opposed to he was actually dead. And then my dad said that my dad went with him in the ambulance and my dad said at one point the ambulance went around a bend really quickly and his arm flew out and landed in my dad's lap. And, and my dad said that when the arm, when his arm landed, that's when he knew he was dead because he said he just felt that there was no life. There was nothing that showed any response. And so his, his hope was crushed. You, you, you look at your life as before and after that moment. What was life like after that moment? The immediate aftermath, like the weeks after something, that is, is a strange mix of um, activity and energy, you know, because you're organising funerals, people are kind of coming, hundreds of people descending on the house constantly, people coming and And actually there was a kind of um, an energy in the house that it just kept you, you just kept going and doing things. I, my mum didn't, she very much stopped and she went into almost a kind of, after the funeral, she was almost catatonic and just kind of almost sat and did nothing for about a month. But I think I was the eldest child. My sister at the time was modeling in Japan. She'd flown home for the funeral, but then went off quite quickly afterwards. My dad decided to go on tour with Wales, who he was managing. So I decided my life in London was over and I was going to stay home and try and help. And my mum had a fledgling property business. So I was kind of running around doing errands for her and trying to kind of like keep this energy going that we'd experienced during the week leading up to the funeral. And then suddenly it all starts to quieten down and people stop coming around. People stop bringing food around. People stop ringing to see if you're okay. And, and then this kind of quietness descends on, on the house and the home and, the, and everybody in it. And, and that's when you really start facing grief because grief, um, I didn't have room to come in, you know, in those first few weeks, there was no, there was no space for it. It was all about energy and activity and trying to do your best for everybody. And then the reality, you know, just on a daily basis of kind of, I mean, every day, even when the energy was there, you'd wake up just with those first thoughts of the day were just, oh God, you know, it really is, it's happened. It's real. It's not, it's not a dream and getting yourself mobilized. But then after the energy left, those, oh God, this is real, those feelings of just despair and kind of sadness it just took longer to get yourself going. And, you know, you do feel kind of just sometimes, or you did feel immobilised with that sadness. And then you have your own children and you start to look at his life differently because when, he, when my son got to 15 and was nearly 16, my kid's birthday is only a few days away from his birthday, I realised when my son turned 16... I realised that I'd been worried about him not being 16 <laughs> because because Daniel never got there. <laughs> so I, you know, I did, I did have a, a fear that I was going to repeat history. If you love the Diver CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favour become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.